Naval Architecture and how a naval architect can help you. Uh, Dan Haynes uh, has been a practicing professional engineer in the marine industry for over 30 years. In 2008, Dan started a naval architecture and engineering consultancy, C3 Systems, <coughs> of which he is currently the president. C3 is focused on yachting and the cruise industry, <coughs> but also has customers in offshore energy, commercial, oceanographic research, and government sectors. C3 is wor working to accelerate the introduction of hybrid and all electronic technologies into the yachting market. Uh, let me introduce at this point Dan Haynes. <laughs> So I'm Dan Haynes, so I'm the, um, the chairman of the Southeast section of the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers. And um, uh, I'm, we use the term SNAMI for that because the other is much too long. So uh, I'll do that from here on out if I say SNAMI. Um, so, so kind of a bold claim. Um, the reason I'm here is to basically uh, try to encourage more communication between yacht brokers and naval architects. So this presentation is really aimed mainly at yacht brokers. Um, and uh, hopefully I can show you some ways that you can engage naval architects and improve your business. First, I'm going to do a pitch for the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers. Um, so so SNAMI is a professional organization. Uh, we've got 6,000 members. Uh, across 85 different countries. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the chairman of the Southeast section. That's the Southeast United States, which is Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina, and we have about 300 members in that region. So there are, there are naval architects around, and I hope that uh, you'll reach out to them. So what I want to do is kind of uh, hit some, some key points of what naval architects do. Um, it's uh, it's an incredibly broad field, and, and SNAMI in general incorporates uh, engineering and naval architects and lots of other professions. Um, I'm mainly going to focus on the naval architecture sort of side of that, but they really blur together. So it's, it's good to think of naval architecture as an engineering kind of profession. Um, so, so basically, what do naval architects do? Uh, well. First off, we try to understand what a customer's needs are, and then we start designing uh, ways to achieve those requirements. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details, but I've kind of broken this down into two general approaches. One of them is, what about a new design? What does a naval architect do if you have a customer who wants to start with a clean sheet of paper and design a new boat? That's kind of the holy grail, and, and seldom do we ever get that opportunity. More frequently, we're invited to participate in some sort of refit. So I want to give you some examples of both of those processes and then kind of explain how you might be able to bring a naval architect in to make a sale. Uh, I did want to point out, uh, all of you are doubtless familiar with um, marine surveyors. I mean, you get a surveyor involved pretty much in every sale appropriately. Um, and, and sometimes there's a confusion about what differentiates marine surveyors and naval architects. Um, so uh, basically naval architects are concerned with the design and engineering and sort of the technical end of it. Um, marine surveyors are more aimed at uh, doing appraisals or evaluations. Um, working on the paperwork to close a sale. The way I like to think about it is that it's really about change. So a marine surveyor will tell you what needs to be changed. If something needs to be changed, naval architect will tell you how to do that change. So with any new design, uh, first thing a naval architect is going to do is start looking at uh, what the appropriate hull form is after figuring out what the client's needs are. So generally, how big is the boat, how much power, how fast, those sorts of things are going to be specified by the client. The next step is to get a, a general idea of what the whole form is going to look like. Seldom does a naval architect sit down and sketch a hull just out of uh, a full cloth. I mean, it, it, usually there is some 
a set of designs or some set of lines that can be used as a starting point for the design. For example, here, this is an expedition yacht that's being built out of aluminum. Um, the lines were basically taken from a Pacific Northwest uh, fishing boat design. Usually what a naval architect will do is uh, once the lines are, the initial set of lines are developed um, from taking typically an existing set of lines and tweaking them, they'll start to model uh, the performance of that hull form. Um, and years ago, that was a very painstaking process, and there were lots of approximations, and we had tables of how different hulls would perform under different conditions. Um, uh, now, computers do all that work. Uh, it hasn't really gotten easier, but it's gotten a lot faster and, and a lot uh, higher quality. So, so this is a, a picture generated by computer software predicting how this particular hull will behave when it's moving through the water. Um, and the nice thing about that sort of analysis is that you can go in and change little aspects of the hull or the conditions and quickly produce some representation of um, how the boat's going to per perform. Now, uh, most naval architects aren't uh, totally comfortable with the results that they get from a CFP simulation getting better every year, but they're still not perfect. Um, I will point out that sailboats are not uh, not to be forgotten. Uh, you can use that same software to predict the flow of uh, wind around the sails and the thrust being generated by the sails. So that's, a, again, a key part of the computational aspect of um, a new design. But it's still a good idea if you have the budget um, and the opportunity and a willing uh, client to do what's called a, a tank testing or a towing tank test. And basically here you actually build a model of the hull and tow it in a, in a long skinny tank and measure how it performs. Um, the advantage of that is that uh, you can directly relate the performance of this model to how the hull will be will perform, it's it's not straightforward. You can't just scale it up. There are lots of lots of fudges that you have to do. But the point is, you can then take that information and put it back into your computational model and tweak that model. And once you get the model, the computational model reflecting how the, the physical model works, then you can use the computer to simulate the performance of that hull in, in different sea states or different conditions that you just wouldn't be able to simulate in a system. So that's kind of the, the new build hull design sequence um, that a naval architect might employ. Uh, sort of the last step uh, is actually constructing it. So, so this is uh, ultimately where we're going. The naval architect prepares a set of drawings that the shipyard or, or the fabricator can use to construct the hull. Material choice at this point uh, is a major issue, and I wanted to point out that um, there's still many boats being built out of wood, it's probably the oldest and, and uh, many would argue the best uh, construction material. Um, and cold molded is a, a wooden construction technique that involves uh, embedding the wood in typically epoxy. Um, of course, fiberglass has been around quite a long time. Steel, uh, probably in terms of tonnage, there's more steel tonnage built than any other uh, material. Aluminum is very popular for yachts, and carbon fiber kind of circling back to that. Um, 15 or 20 years ago, carbon, carbon fiber was a very exotic uh, material. You'd see it on you know, 12 meters and uh, skis and very specialized applications, it's become much cheaper and there's a surprising number of whole holes now incorporating carbon fiber to a, to a very large extent. So how does this relate to uh, closing a sale with a potential customer for a new build? And, and the point here is that, that if you can bring a naval architect in early in the process and get them working with you with the client to define their requirements carefully, then then you can do this, the, the, hull, the lines of the hull, the testing, the material choice, way up front in the process, 
and it will be much less costly than going through a bunch of design cycles and having to come back later on and change, for example, uh, oh, well, I'm not going to use, I don't want to use aluminum, I want to make it out of steel because it's cheap. So uh, more frequently than whole uh, designs or new builds are refits. And I wanted to touch on some examples of, of refits here. So, so basically, you've got a boat and it's working, typically, but it doesn't work exactly the way the client wants it to work. What can you do? Um, for example, um, this is a 70-foot horizon, actually down in Miami. Um, the, uh, the owner is a very, very smart guy, mechanical engineer, been boating all his life, loves his boat. Um, and he decided he wanted a better uh, lift for his tender, and he designed a very clever, stable, high-integrity mechanism and put the lift on the boat, and he anticipated that he was going to add some weight and it might be a problem, and it turned out it was. So, so he added this, uh, this platform. You can see it in the middle, in the center. That's a hydraulic lift. Um, and the squat in the boat got really bad, especially transitioning uh, to, to semi-planing. So he engaged the naval architect, and they, uh, uh, the naval architect designed a set of sponsons to go on the transom. You can see those uh, in the center image there, low and aft. Um, and then at the same time, they decided to add a, uh, a bulbous bow. Well, this was done pretty quickly, so the, the, the sponsons, the bulbous valve, the paint job was all done in 60 days, and, uh, and, it, and it was not particularly expensive, and as a result, um, he solved his squat problem, so now the, the boat actually runs, it sits on her lines uh, at rest perfectly, and she runs with uh, a half degree less uh, running angle, and the cruise speed was increased by 1.8 knots at 1,700 RPM, which I think was about uh, 13 knots. Um, and, and intriguingly, the, the fuel consumption actually went down. So uh, again, Naval Architect got involved, involved. The cost was not great, and the results were very, very pleasing for the owner. Um, some other things you can do with uh, the Naval Architect and refits propellers. Everybody has propeller issues. Um, it, 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 you can always, almost always optimize the propeller. Uh, to be fair, there are plenty of people, especially in this area, who are uh, propeller practitioners, I'll say, really experts. Uh, they can usually do an incredibly good job just out of their experience picking a propeller for a yacht. Um, there are times, though, that that, that, that isn't, doesn't get the job done. And once again, using computational tools, CFT tools, you can model the flow of water around the propeller. Uh, in this example, they're, they're actually, to be fair, these are, these are unrelated images up there. It's kind of, uh, I just stuck them up there, now it looks like one relates to the other. The one on the left is just a model of a change to a propeller that was uh, uh, optimized in a computer, and basically uh, the red area you see is, is the, uh, what the propeller will be changed to, um, so basically straightening the propeller out. And, it, and the point of that was to improve the efficiency of, of the propeller at a slightly different running speed. And on the right is an analysis of um, basically the pressure field around the propeller. So again, you can use that to, to optimize. Um, I, and the important thing I think to point out here is that these compute, the, it, it's pretty straightforward to pick a propeller when the propeller is just running in the open ocean with nothing around it. But when you involve the shape of the hull, um, especially hulls with appurtenances like stabilizer fins, that water flow gets really complicated, and, and very often that's the source of noise and propeller inefficiency, and, and you, it's hard to predict, but with computational tools, uh, you can make a shot at that, and then you model the propeller uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the flow around the hull. Here's an example of a refit uh, hull extension. So these are pretty common. They're very effective, pretty inexpensive. Um, 
in this case, the transom was basically sawed off. There's going to be a three foot uh, extension added. Um, this can be quick and painless and give your customers uh, a lot more in, in this particular case, uh, 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 app deck space. Um, it, the, the trick is to keep from having to move the running gear. If, uh, if you extend it so much or extend it, try to extend it in place that makes the running gear ineffective, then the cost is going to be much greater. Bring in a naval architect, have them take a look. Usually these sorts of extensions on boats kind of in this range are not particularly expensive. On the other hand, um, there are big hull extensions. Uh, in this case, to be honest, this is not a yacht, it's a cruise ship. Um, although, um, crew, yachts are getting bigger and bigger, and this is not that far from the size of, of some yachts that have been launched recently. So basically, they took welding, cutting torches, cut the hull in half, stretched it out 100 feet, dropped a new, uh, a new hull section in, welded it up, painted it, and uh, went to sea, making more money. Launch and recovery. So lots of boats these days now are putting more and more stuff into the water, toys of various sorts. Um, and when those are heavy, uh, they need to be handled with machinery. And that machinery needs to be well designed and, most important, well attached to the boat. So this is an example of a, a yacht that's added a submarine. You can see there on the stern, there's a little two-man submarine there. And the, the yellowish thing is an A-frame, and that's used to pluck the sub out of the water and put it back in the water. Um, Got to have some analysis done on that design um, before you just go arbitrarily telling the client that um, they can put a submarine on their boat. So a lot, a lot of work there just making sure the sub can be used and fits. Um, So that was just a smattering of things that naval architects do, new designs and refits. And, and they're all over the map. You can invent all, uh, imagine all kinds of different uh, applications for uh, changes to a yacht that an owner might want to make. Um, I wanted to just give you a sense of kind of my opinion of what, what's going on in the yachting world and, and where yachts are trending in, as far as design goes. Of course, they're always getting bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, uh, when I was growing up, a 65-foot Hatteras was, uh, was big, and they're not anymore. Um, so, so we see more and more open deck space. Um, we see swim, big swim platforms, lots of glass. Um, a number of yachts now with kind of floor-to-ceiling glass you know, all the way around on the main deck. Um, and, and I think of that kind of as embracing the ocean. So basically owners uh, no longer kind of staying inside all the time, but actually getting out and, and looking at the ocean, playing in the ocean, watching it. Um, one thing that's for sure is that uh, plumb bows or square bows are, are back. Uh, I personally haven't gotten used to that aesthetic yet, but I will. Um, and and minimal, clean minimalist lines. Um, these are, you know, and, and lot, yachts that are large enough to actually accommodate them. Um, better utility. So we see expedition yachts now. Um, Twenty years ago, people didn't talk about expedition yachts. But they're they're very popular. Um, toys, of course, submarine helicopters, you know, mini sport fish, you know, all kinds of stuff going aboard bigger yachts. Um, certainly, lots of uh, carbon fiber uh, being used now which is expensive, but it gives you a lot of performance for the weight and improved fuel efficiency. Um, and uh, another trend, of course, is uh, especially with larger yachts, the owners are looking to charter them. So, so we see designs that are charter friendly. That's not just the accommodations, but also uh, looking to the regulatory requirements uh, to make a boat charterable. And finally, uh, hybrids. Um, certainly, hybrids were not around 10 or 15 years ago. Um, now there are lots of boats uh, being done as hybrids, and um, that's a, something that's particularly interesting to me. Um, and, and this applies all up and down the size scale. So 
Uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So just kind of zooming in, um, this is an expedition yacht, one of the bigger and uh, more impressive ones that Tom and uh, Sea Explorer. So these expedition yachts now are, are being designed to put people into really exotic parts of the world, just, you know, Antarctica, I mean, really. Um, not everyone can afford a yacht like that, but um, be nice. Toys. Hmm, my image is missing, but there used to be a, uh, a submarine there. Uh, um, so, and I wanted to mention, we, you know, it, it amazes me how many um, yachts now are, are, have submarines aboard. Um, I, uh, I have a good friend, a scientist, a deep ocean scientist, and he's been diving in small submersibles, uh, scientific vessels, for his whole career, which is long. Um, and uh, the number of submarines available for scientific use being operated by the National Science Foundation, for example, are, are dwindling, and yet these submakers are flourishing, and people are buying submarines to put on their yachts. We've got a company in Florida, up in uh, Vero Beach, um, they're in Vero Triton yachts, and also um, another one that's very popular both with uh, yachts and crews is uh, U Boat Works. They're in, out of the Netherlands, have a very nice line of yachts with depth capabilities up to 2,500 meters, which is actually deeper than a lot of deep ocean research submersibles can go. And this is Savannah, kind of an iconic uh, hybrid yacht. So this is a really big yacht, and she's, uh, she's a hybrid. So, and, and the advantage of a hybrid is um, generally they're overall more fuel efficient for a variety of reasons. Um, and specifically when they're in port or, or pier side, uh, you often don't have to run the gen set. So now they're, they're super quiet, they're not very maneuverable and very quiet, making very comfortable. Um, doesn't just apply to boats of this size. Um, there's a, a, there are a lot of sport fish now that are being equipped with hybrid drives. And that's the big advantage there is being able to troll with no engines running. So you troll on the batteries, doesn't take that much power, um, and it's much more pleasant. And we're starting to see all electric boats. Um, so here, this is a Hinkley uh, 28, I believe. So no internal combustion engine at all. No diesel, no gasoline. Um, charge it up at the dock and uh, and very silently go run away. And uh, the problem is that they still have rather limited range. So this, uh, I think the Hinkley is um, 25 knots and has about a 40 nautical mile range, which for a lot of folks is plenty. So back to the theme, how do naval architects help close sales? Um, you know, certainly with a new build, that's a long process, and, and, and there are lots of questions to answer, and having a naval architect aboard is going to help you quickly convince the owner that they're designing, envisioning, and that they're going to get something that suits their purposes. Um, another thing a naval architect, architect can do is listen to what your client is trying to achieve and then know, by knowing the characteristics of different vessel types, help the client get to that selection more quickly. And of course, you, you guys have been around those a lot. You know these things. Um, uh, refits are, are a big opportunity. And um, certainly, if a, if a customer is dithering, uh, you know, not able to make a decision on whether or not to move ahead, and they're dithering because they're not sure that there's a feature about the yacht that they like, uh, see if it can be changed. You know, have a naval architect come in and, and take a look and say, well, yeah, you know, that bulkhead doesn't need to be there. We can move it. It's cheap. Or, you know, they want to move the bulkhead, and the naval architect says, well, you, you can't. You know, the boat will fall apart. Thank you. You move that bulkhead. So these are kind of the things that you can you can interact early on with a naval architect to work out. Um, basically, uh, I would encourage you to. Uh, 
find a naval architect and, and start working with them. Um, how do you find a naval architect? Um, of course, referrals. Um, I would recommend that you think about attending some of our meetings. We once a month we have a meeting of the section here in South Florida. Um, uh, if you want to give me your contact information, I will be happy to put you on the list and send you notices when the meetings are going to happen. Um, and you can run into Naval Architects there. And, and we often have technical presentations. My friend, something. Um, look at the area of practice that that Naval Architect participates in. Um, so there, there are lots of different focuses for Naval Architects. So you, you have to make sure that you're getting one that does what you think your client is looking for. Um, and of course, evaluate their experience. And most important, just talk to them about, about boats. I mean, you want uh, an able architect that likes the same things in boats that you like, because that's probably what your clients are looking for. So, please adopt an able architect. Uh, um, uh, and, and I ought to mention, uh, you know, naval architects, like everybody else, understand that uh, there's always a sales cost associated with doing business. So, so I think, it, it, you know, as, as with any profession, when you're thinking about, well, do I, do I call somebody and have them come in and talk to my client, and then somebody's got to pay for that time. But I think you'll find that, as with most professions, you know, a naval architect is going to be happy to come in and meet with you and, and offer some suggestions without uh, expecting compensation for it. Um, on the hope that eventually that will turn into a big project and I'll make lots of money. Um, so, um, please find a naval architect. There are, there are some of them here in this room. They are amongst you. Um, let me know and I'll help you put in touch with them. So that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs>